On this edition of Sightings, is Barry Pomeroy Castle the most haunted place in England? You could see directly through her. It sounded like this. An exclusive Sightings investigation. Then, can the moon drive us mad? O.J. Simpson happened three days after the new moon. The Bobbitt incident happened three days after the new moon, both at night, both using a knife. Also, practitioners give us a rare look inside the world of Santeria and Paulo Mayombe. When you're dealing with this elemental force, it's very dangerous. Plus, is this the true face of aliens or a vision shaped by Hollywood? I think it's very possible that these beings are able to control how we perceive them. Later, these people have a special psychic connection that leads them to water. I don't know of many well drillers nowadays that don't use a witcher. And what would you do if you encountered a ghost? Be ready to get evidence, you know, get tangible evidence of your haunting. Welcome to Sightings. I'm Tim White. With Halloween Fest approaching, there are ghosts and goblins in the air. Well, at least the paper mache variety. But in England, there's one ancient site where spirits and apparitions from the past seem to hang around all year long. It's Barry Pomeroy Castle, and it's earned the title of Great Britain's most haunted landmark. The whole thing really about this place is, is amazing. The ghosts that occur here. We had a strange feeling there was something wrong. It just started getting pretty weird. It's always been very still, as though you're waiting for something to happen. You learn to control your imagination, because at Berry Pomeroy, if you let your imagination run away with you, you could be a raven lunatic. In its heyday, Berry Pomeroy Castle hosted princes, kings, and crusaders. And since 1688, no one has wanted to live within these walls. Visitors say there's something evil inside. It sounded like this. <laughs> Ghostly shrieks are heard, ghoulish apparitions are seen, and photographs have captured the dark side of the castle. The crumbling walls of this once great fortress are perched above the desolate moors that blanket southern England. It is a land of ancient superstitions, defiled tombs, and long abandoned graveyards. It's just brooding and evil. The evil is there in the atmosphere. But is it only atmosphere? Sightings has teamed up with Tony Cornell, Great Britain's premier paranormal investigator, for the first in depth study ever conducted at Barry Pomeroy Castle. In my view, it's one of the most interesting cases I think I've come across. Basically because so many people have seen things and felt things. You don't get that in all hauntings. Uh, you waste a lot of time, but there's enough evidence that I've heard that we've got to examine this. Cornell's first step was to gather historical and anecdotal data. He sought out historian Derek Seymour, who has studied the ghostly presences here for more than 70 years. Every day I thought of this castle. If it was a lovely sunny day, I used to think, I wonder what it's looking like at the castle today. If there was a thunderstorm and the wind was howling, I used to think, oh, I wouldn't like to be at the castle today. Oh, no. The best known ghost here is the White Lady. And the White Lady is, of course, the unfortunate Lady Margaret, who is seen to walk at the top of the stairs in that tower and down in the dungeon. She is really quite frequently seen. Folklore tells of two sisters in love with the same man. Lady Margaret, the younger and more beautiful of the two, was imprisoned in the castle's dungeon by her jealous sister. There, she starved to death. Modern-day visitor Anne Benny recalls her encounter with the White Lady. When we first went down the stairs into the chamber, it was dark, it was damp, and it wasn't a nice place to be. But then this evil presence you could sense it was evil i don't know how to describe it any other way really and then i heard the footsteps very quick very light and 
the closer she got, the more panic-stricken I felt. I just wanted to get out of the place and, and not come back. <laughs> Tony Cornell walked the castle grounds with Jack Hazard, the former master stonemason of Barry Pomeroy. It was while working here in 1986 that Hazard captured what many consider the most authentic photographic evidence of a ghostly presence here. It started to rain and it's, the wind started to blow. And I thought there was something happening unusual. So I got the disc camera out and I took five or six shots. And on the five of the prints, white shapes came out. Whatever they were, I have no idea, but it was a most unusual Sunday morning. Sightings also heard stories of a haunting blue lady. She is thought to be the spirit of a 14th century Pomeroy who was raped by her father and then bore his child. Legend has it that she murdered the child in a fit of shame and rage. And this unfortunate child was strangled by the mother who did not want it, of course. Now, she's quite frequently seen. She's very evil, and people don't like the sight of her at all. Visitors Simon Day and Tim King believe the apparition they saw on a trip to the castle was the Blue Lady. What we saw was a figure of an elderly woman. She had a blue dress on, but you could see directly through her, and she was just staring at us, and this noise started. But when you look in the direction where it actually happened, you can't see a thing. There was nothing there. It screeched and stopped, and within a second, it was in the bush next to us. There was this really amazing screech. It scared the hell out of us. And they felt there that there was a power far stronger than themselves and became absolutely terrified and went. Terror also enveloped psychic investigator Bob Dolby, and it would not go away. I was conducting an investigation expecting nothing at all. I was about to leave when just by the rampart walls and the stairs leading down, I saw this huge black cloud. And to me, it seemed probably the hugest and blackest, deepest thing I'd ever seen. Dolby claims the black cloud, what he terms the evil entity, trailed him through the castle, then followed him back to his house nearby. That same night, he tried to use a Ouija board to make contact with the terrifying presence. Is there anybody there? I. Yes. The glass moved erratically around the board, which was very unusual at the time. And then she made herself known. She popped up. Isabel. She struck as a very evil little girl. Through the Ouija board, they met a little girl named Isabel, who revealed that she was the bastard child of a disinherited Pomeroy from the 17th century. The Dolbys believe she spoke through the board and then actually appeared hours later in the Dolby bedroom. I actually went to bed early and left the group downstairs experimenting with the Ouija board and actually had the experience of somebody sitting on the back of my legs while I was lying on the bed. Thinking it was Bob messing about, I told him to get off, turned around and it was actually a little girl with a, just a manic grin on her face. Well, they both came to see me the next afternoon. They were so terrified. And I can tell you that they were frozen with shock. There are hundreds of stories like these, all pointing to a bizarre force that permeates these ancient limestone walls. For Tony Cornell, these subjective accounts demand an objective investigation. To me, this is probably, I go farther and say it is, the most haunted castle in England. I'm glad you brought me here. You're opening my eyes, and I think that uh, I should go back and suggest that we get in touch with British heritage and that we do a serious investigation over a period of time. There is something pretty potent here. There's a very evil force and if ever you encounter it on going to Berry Pomeroy, get out quick. Based on the preliminary findings of our investigation, Tony Cornell believes that Barry Pomeroy Castle deserves a full-scale, long-term study. The problem is access. British Heritage, the trustees of Barry Pomeroy Castle, are not believers and so far have denied all requests for an intensive investigation. Coming up next, are they eyewitnesses to an historic phenomenon or have their memories been shaped by Hollywood? We just have to trust our hearts and kind of sift through all this and find out who's telling the truth. If creatures from an alien civilization are here on Earth, what do they look like? How did they get here? 
These questions are now being answered by two distinct groups. First, the artists and writers who create the pop culture version of our cosmic cousins, and the people who believe that they have actual first-hand knowledge, the eyewitnesses and abductees. Well, strangely, both groups have similar visions. So who's influencing whom? The thing you'll never forget when you look into the face of these things is the eyes. Very large, intimidating black eyes. Very small opening for a mouth, no ears. Tremendous head, um, very thin body, uh, long arms. They're called greys. Abductees insist these are the real aliens and that they're a far cry from what Hollywood depicts. And for the most part, they're right. The creatures created by generations of sci-fi writers and illustrators are far more fantastic than the slender, featureless humanoids reported by abductees. But it is this dark-eyed face that has come to dominate the public's conception of what a real extraterrestrial looks like. The more people know about what aliens are expected to look like, the more they're likely to describe an alien as looking like that preconceived idea. It's a self-feeding kind of a thing. In 10 years, there won't be any kind of alien except a gray. Our supposed eyewitnesses seen the true face of aliens, or is their vision influenced by popular culture? I think it's both. I think it's definitely both. And that we just have to trust our hearts and kind of sift through all this and find out who's telling the truth and who isn't. The rise of this alien archetype coincides with the increasing number of supposed abductees. But is there evidence that depictions of greys predate the abduction phenomenon? The greys, I think, are not a modern idea. Science fiction illustrator and historian Ron Miller has traced the depiction of greys in popular culture. He's unearthed suggestive artwork from the 19th century. It comes from fairy tales, science fiction, film, a lot of sources that go back decades, even a century or more. One of the earliest sort of realistic depictions of an alien I have from a book that was published in 1884, which shows uh, the mummified body of a Martian. And in fact, it bears a startling resemblance to the modern picture of an alien. But those early drawings are just a needle in the science fiction haystack. Thousands of creatures, from the sublime to the utterly ridiculous, have been created by artists who use a little science and a lot of imagination. Science fiction reached a creative peak in the 1950s, when an atmosphere of anything goes produced hundreds of outlandish movies that seemed laughable. But that all changed in 1964, when a New Hampshire couple, Betty and Barney Hill, were the first to claim publicly that they had been abducted by aliens. This is a composite of what they look like. Larger eyes, smaller nose, no lips, no protruding part of the ear, no hair, and uh, a gray tone to the skin. Ufologists embraced the Hill case as a significant turning point, but author James Oberg believes it was TV, not a real ET, that influenced the Hills. A lot of Betty's memories are directly traceable back to a movie called Invaders from Mars. Many of the themes, many of the imageries from that film appear in almost recognizable form in Betty's story. In the account, there was kidnapping being taken on board a flying saucer. There were needles being inserted into people's brains or other parts of their bodies. Barney Hill's recollections of the abduction differed from Betty's in one significant detail. Barney claimed the aliens had huge eyes, the same kind of eyes depicted in this episode of The Outer Limits. The unique feature here is, is these wrap-round eyes, the eyeballs that move off to the forehead, off to the side of the head. It was, a, it was very original. And yet, less than two weeks after this face first appeared on television, Barney Hill, under hypnosis, suddenly remembered that his aliens had eyes like that and eyes that wrapped around. Was it cause and effect? Did he see the show? Was his memory polluted by this Hollywood version? Can't prove it, but the sequence is highly suggestive. I think it's very possible that these beings are able to control how we perceive them and perceive the experience that we're sharing with them, that they're very much able to manipulate it. Artist Steve Neal also believes that he's been abducted and that his art is drawn from first-hand experience. It's, it's difficult to say why this, the, the gray look, the black-eyed, bubble-headed look has become so dominant for any other reason that 
these are the beings that are visiting here. The one event that catapulted the cult of the Greys into mass acceptance can be summed up in two words, Steven Spielberg. His landmark 1977 blockbuster, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, has been seen by more than 100 million Americans. Oh, Close Encounters, for good or evil, had an enormous effect on uh, what people expected aliens to look like. And if anything really focused all these disparate threads into one sort of standard alien, it was Close Encounters. Spielberg himself was picking up all these loose threads and the descriptions he based them on that Heineck provided him with were, of course, based on, once again, a long tradition of ideas and images. We would still be having maybe more variety in Aliens now if it had been for that movie. Joe Alves was the production designer for Close Encounters. His original drawings were based on the early abductee accounts collected by Professor J. Allen Heineck. I think what was unique ab about Close Encounters is it was science fiction and yet in a sense it wasn't because we weren't manufacturing something f that was convenient. We took these things from all the encounters that we could record and sort of put it into the funnel and it came out with these kind of images. An alien that does not look like a human being is quite likely to scare the bejesus out of us. There has been a very definite evolution from the, uh, the bug-eyed monster of the 30s. Gradually, you came into less monstrous-looking aliens, but still aliens. And I think the uh, biggest shock was around the late 50s when we began to get these uh, reports of uh, direct alien contacts. Kelly Fries, known as the Dean of Science Fiction Illustrators, is disturbed by today's dominance of the Greys. In a career spanning more than five decades, Fries has created a rich palette of creatures he believes may be out there somewhere. I, I hate to think that the universe is, is so dull that that's the best it can come up with. Are we supposed to assume that only one race uh, managed to uh, accomplish space flight and come to the Earth? Or are there more, more races out there? If so, what do the other races look like? Admittedly, there are similarities between abductee accounts and old television shows. But considering the vast number of creatures created in this century, perhaps the similarities are coincidence, not deliberate deception. Science fiction tries to create believable characters, and abductees believe that in a few instances, they've gotten it right. Abductees believe that they have seen the face of an alien civilization, and this is it. But Dr. Alvin Lawson, who has studied the abduction phenomenon for more than 10 years, suggests another possibility. Perhaps abductees are actually remembering their own birth experiences. With a surgical mask covering the nose and the mouth and bright operating room lights behind, could a human face look like this to a newborn? Next on Sightings, experts offer a guide to a ghostly encounter. First thing that they'll say is, you're going to think I'm crazy, but I don't think you're crazy. I've heard it all before. During this week leading up to All Hallows' Eve, Halloween, legend has it that the spirits of the dead are allowed to roam freely on the earth. What would you do if you were suddenly confronted by what seemed to be a ghost? We're often asked by viewers how to document a haunting. So we went to our experts on this most haunted of holidays, and here's what they advise. The first thing that they'll say is, you're gonna think I'm crazy, but this, this is going on. And I tell them, no, I don't think you're crazy. I've heard it all before. Al Rober is a psychical researcher with over 25 years of experience investigating the paranormal. Rober's studies of haunting phenomena have taken him around the world in pursuit of hard evidence. Rober's interest in ghosts and spirits stems from his personal belief that every living being contains energy that does not die when the physical body dies. Every one of us is made up of energy. Now, when we die, what happens? Do we go into a box six feet in the ground and that energy stays there? I don't think so. The energy has to go someplace, okay? Uh, I think in cases of haunting, somehow this energy stays behind. After years of investigation, Rober has developed a checklist for anyone who believes they have seen or felt a ghost. First thing to do is to start keeping a log. Put down what happened. 
the length of time that it happened. Put down who was there in the room at the time of the experience. If there's four people present, did all four people experience it? If the activity seems to happen more often around one certain individual, that should be noted, or in certain areas of the house. The person should draw up a floor plan of the house and mark each area where activity has taken place and what activity took place there. Have a camera ready, preferably a Polaroid camera, or, or a uh, tape recorder ready. Be ready to get evidence, you know, get tangible evidence of your haunting. In addition to recording every aspect of your experience, Rober suggests doing some outside research. Find out everything you can about the history of your house, the land it sits on, and other ghost phenomena that have been reported nearby. If the haunting continues and is frightening to you, Rober suggests contacting a psychic. There are those psychics that claim that they can actually absorb the spirit into their own person and then release it at a later time through meditation. Although psychics can help, Rober believes that the best way to deal with a haunting is to embrace it as a once-in-a-lifetime experience. I would tell them to attempt to learn to coexist with it for the time being. If they can coexist with it, if they can somehow reduce their own tensions, then I think what they'll find is the activity will decrease. One more important step is to look for any natural occurrences that could explain away the haunting, in particular, the site's proximity to high tension wires. The physical effects of EMFs, electromagnetic fields, are hotly debated, but it does seem to have an influence in many haunting cases. When sightings continues. We don't go and put a gun to your head. We take your name, we put it in the pot, and then you will drop dead somewhere in the street. Inside the world of Santeria and Paulo, then deadly effects of the moon and the water witch's gift. The day after the invasion of Panama in 1989, U.S. forces discovered a strange house in the Panamanian jungle owned by then General Manuel Noriega. Inside, rooms had been turned into occult shrines. There were remains from animal sacrifices, jars filled with blood, bone, and herbs, and cryptic curses defaming Noriega's enemies, including then-President George Bush. It was a rare glimpse at the international power of a little-known and much misunderstood religion called Santeria. <laughs> What started as a small sect of wildly devout worshippers in one African tribe has spread significantly across the Atlantic to Cuba, then Miami, and now the power of Santeria is felt from New York to Los Angeles, from Caracas to Tierra del Fuego. Fostered by slave trading in the last century and exposure to Catholicism in this century. The religion was originally practiced by the Yoruba in what is today southwestern Nigeria, mainly. When uh, the Yoruba came to Cuba as slaves, they had to make cer certain adaptations to the environment, and the resulting uh, religion is Santeria. But when East met West, some Santeros split from the largely benign practices of Santerio to form Palo, a religion that turned spirits into demons and corpses into objects of worship. We have to have an actual spirit that will do our bidding. So there are ceremonies where they go into the, to, into the cemetery and they disinter a body and they ask if they can use that spirit of that corpse. And if the spirit of that corpse says yes, that it will do what the paleto asks, then yes, we take different pieces of bone from it, whether it's the skull, fingertip bones, or shin bones, and we incorporate those into the pot. The dark rituals of Polo are often confused with Santeria because to satisfy the spirits, both religions practice animal sacrifice. We don't kill cats and dogs, okay, no, no pets. Uh, we use goats, we use lambs and chickens, and we do eat these animals. Uh, we don't torture the animal. The person who does the animal sacrifice is trained so that the animal is killed instantly. Santeria and Palo also share a belief in the power of spirit possession. In Santeria, spirits, called orishas, are summoned through music and prayer and are believed to enter the bodies of the worshippers. They shave your head, they cut 
a small cut in your scalp and implant actually the essence of the Orisha, the power of the Orisha inside your head, um, you become known as Iyawo. Iyawo means the wife of the Orisha. Even if you're a male, you're still the wife of the Orisha. Once you go into the room of the initiation, you feel the, the vibes, you feel energies, that's something different. During these initiation ceremonies, believers enter an altered state where their mind and body are given over to the Orisha. Santeros believe that in this altered state, miracles can happen. Jackie Rodriguez, a Cuban-American baptized in the Catholic Church, was initiated into Santeria at 22. She was looking for hope and healing after a series of difficult miscarriages. The doctor said that I should stop trying to have babies because it was going to be worse for me or I was going to cause some kind of complication. Jackie believes it was the power of her Orisha that helped her sustain a new life within her. Well, when I went to the doctor, I was scared when he said I was pregnant. I said, oh, no, you know, because I was already scared of losing them. And uh, he said, well, this one looks like it's pretty good and it looks OK. Your pregnancy looks well. And I was shocked. The doctor was shocked as well. Jackie's son is now eight years old and a Santeria initiate. Jackie herself has become a priestess and is dedicated to helping others use Santeria for good. Anybody can be initiated. The religion has people from all kinds of social backgrounds. It is a family religion. With more than five million members in the U.S., Santeria tries to distance itself from Polo, where the power of the Orishas is used for evil. The same rituals that create life for Santeros are used to curse and even kill through Polo. We don't go and put a gun to your head. What we do is we take your name, we put it in the pot, and we do our ceremonies. And then you will drop dead somewhere in the street. But I want to stress to you that the majority of the paleros do not do evil. Usually, most of the spells they do is to cure and heal people. The only time you actually see them doing evil is in self-defense, when somebody else is trying to hurt them. The centerpiece for Palo ceremonies is the Nganga, an iron cauldron filled with ritual items like herbs, nails, and sometimes human remains. This ceremonial soup is thought to attract the Orishas, who are thought to spring from the Nganga. When you're dealing with this elemental force, it's very dangerous. If you don't know what you're doing, you can hurt yourself, you see. So when I go and do a spell on somebody, I go in front of my pot and I ask my pot, am I justified in doing this spell for this person? If the pot tells me no, no matter how much money, no matter how much they try to persuade me, I will not do it. Ngangas have led to the popular but erroneous belief that human sacrifices are part of Santeria and Palo. Poleros insist the innocent have nothing to fear from their practices. Jim Dibble was the U.S. Army's leading occult expert when he came face to face with the dark side of Polo during a raid on the so-called witch house of Manuel Noriega. Upon entering this house located on Fort Amador, it became apparent to me that, in fact, what we were looking at was not drugs. But what it was were manifestations of a more deviant uh, practicing of Santeria. The house was devoted to Palo and black magic. Among the items, a split cow's tongue, nailed shut and buried in rice, inside the names of Noriega's enemies. When I first was able to discover that these items were linked directly to Noriega, I was astounded. Not only because a world leader was bound by these beliefs, guided by these beliefs, but this is the first time I'd have been able to see these types of examples, these manifestations in reality. Hundreds of politicians and world leaders were named in curses called workings. I encountered a number of workings that involved George Bush. Typically, George Bush's name would be written on a piece of paper, and then this piece of paper would be placed either in gelatin or in cornmeal and then wrapped, in the case of cornmeal, it would be wrapped in a banana leaf, tied securely, and placed in the freezer. It's not hard to see that Noriega was trying to influence the way George Bush thought about him and the way he acted against him. Noriega believed these workings empowered him and that he could control his enemies through the spells he cast. They could use a spell to sweeten you. They could use a spell to make your life a bit of misery. They could use the spell to, uh, to bring you good fortune. And uh, 
Judging from what uh, was done there, I would say that these were uh, spells used to control, to put these people under his control, so they would do his bidding. While Paulo continues to operate in the shadows, Santeria has an open door policy and is accessible through neighborhood botanicas. You find all kinds of uh, really um, interesting paraphernalia here, which is really the, the basis for the religion. Kari here is the owner of uh, this botanica. She has an increasing number of Americans becoming involved and interested in Santeria and Palo. Santeria has no aspect that needs to be feared by people that live in the United States. But certainly, it has an aspect that could be manipulated for destructive purposes. They say man is, uh, is only afraid of what he doesn't know. Once you know what Apollo is, you really shouldn't be afraid of it, because all Apollo is is a religion of natural elements. That's all we work with is with nature. I think the most important thing is that we're not here to hurt anybody. We're just here to help those who we can help and who the Orishas let us help. As the American military's leading authority on the occult, James Dibble would seem to be a prime target for the wrath of Santeros. Dibble has experienced some unusual occurrences, mostly mechanical and electrical malfunctions, while he's lecturing about the occult. But so far, he has escaped the deadly curse of Paulo Mayambe. Coming up next on Sightings. Some nights you'll get people talking to street lights, you know, barking like dogs. Things go a little crazy at the time of full moon. For millennia, humankind has looked to the moon with wonder and awe. Our nearest neighbor in space has inspired lovers, scientists, and madmen. In fact, the word lunatic has at its root the Latin word for moon. The moon's effect on our planet can be measured with the tides. But what about its effect on human beings? If the Simpson crime had happened 400 years ago, people finding two badly mutilated bodies with animal paw prints because a dog was present in the scene, uh, they might have said, you know, werewolves. The L.A. riots was, I think, three days before the new moon. O.J. Simpson happened three days after the new moon. The Bobbitt incident happened three days after the new moon, both at night, both using a knife. It is a beautiful sight, the full moon rising high in the night sky. But while the moon casts its heavenly glow, it seems all hell breaks loose on Earth. During the full moon, reports of murder, violence, and admissions to psychiatric hospitals all rise. Many scientists say moon madness is myth, but at the Griffith Observatory in Los Angeles, calls come in daily insisting there is a link. If you ask emergency personnel, Mark. squeeze my hands. Police, fire, doctors, uh, what influence does the moon have? They'll all tell you for certain things go a little crazy at the time of full moon. Tonight, yeah, we had a guy that apparently was trying to kill himself and uh, stuck himself in the stomach with a steak knife all the way up to the handle and was running around the house. And uh, when the officers got there, uh, they were trying to calm him down, and his main concern was that he wanted a cigarette. Sightings rode along with police in Pomona, California during one recent full moon. This city's pretty weird as it is. Uh, I never really, you know, consciously thought about it. I'm sure there's probably been one or two nights where the, the city was jumping, and if I would have looked up, it probably would have been full. Some nights you'll get five or six uh, what we call 5150s, people walking in traffic, uh, talking to street lights, uh, you know, barking like dogs. People who supposedly transform into animals are nothing new. They're just the modern chapter in an age-old belief in the moon's ability to bring out the beast within humankind. More than 1,000 years ago, moon rituals would transform participants into what we now call werewolves. They would do this by um, either drinking a concoction of herbs. Uh, they would very often bind their waist with a pelt of wolf skin. They would light a fire and um, urinate in a circle around it. And there was a chant where they actually asked the wolf spirit to enter into their body and take over their soul. Preferably, this was done at the full of the moon, when the moon was at its zenith. 
But did the moon cause their transformation or simply illuminate it? The connection of the werewolf to the full moon probably begins with just the notion that wolves and coyotes howl at the moon. That linked up with the idea that the moon is always changing, and it seems like a supernatural transformation to traditional people, and so that can create the notion that something like a wolf could change into a man or vice versa. Forensic scientist and crime historian E.J. Wagner documents the link between the moon and its reported gruesome effects on people. There was a 14-year-old boy named Jean Grenet who confessed to being a werewolf and said he'd, he'd attacked and killed several children and they uh, incarcerated him in a monastery for the rest of his life. And he spent the rest of his life groveling on all fours, would eat only raw meat, which he tore apart. There's no close correlation between the phase of the moon and human behavior. People often think that there must be because the moon makes the tides. That's water and of course human beings are 80% water. But tidal forces on human beings are much less than on the earth. In fact, a book I have in my hand would exert more tidal force than the moon ever would. But consider these unsettling acts conducted during a full moon. An AP Wire story on April 11th, 1982, reports 12 murders in 12 hours. A man in England insists that the full moon drove him to commit gruesome crimes. And the list goes on. There has yet to be a single comprehensive scientific study on the lunar effect on human beings. But anecdotal evidence is pervasive, pointing to a rise in suicide, crime, arson, earthquakes, and other earth changes. In Miami, Florida, Jeff Warren Hyman studies lunar cycles and charts their effects. His newsletter uses this data to predict high and low points for each month. If you're looking for the explosive period, it's one day after the full moon, the eve of the full moon to one day after, and, and about five days before new moon through one day after new moon. This is where you really see the, this is where they go to town. There are only anecdotes and theories for now. But as Nobel Prize winner Robert Millikan has said, if man is not affected in some way by the planets, sun, and moon, he is the only thing on Earth that isn't. Next on Sightings, a mysterious ability succeeds where science fails. I don't know of many well drillers nowadays that don't use a witcher. Before I did, now I don't. When astronomers look for the shape of the universe, they use radio telescopes. When geneticists look deep inside DNA, they use supercomputers. And when drilling engineers look for water, they also call in someone special. Someone who uses something like this. There's no way in the world that you could, can explain it, except that it's something mysterious, and it's wonderful, and it works. The search for water is the search for life. And dowsing, our most ancient method of finding water, is still in constant use today. Scientists have yet to invent an instrument that can locate water more accurately than the forked stick depicted in this 16th century woodcut. But there's no earthly reason to believe that dowsing doesn't go way back to maybe the Stone Age, because it's so practical. Many dowsers, also called water witches, believe that the divining rod itself is not powerful, but that it acts as an indicator of the psychic power within each individual dowser. I think of all the psychic abilities, like clairvoyance or telepathy, various others, dowsing is the most accessible. But the source of their ability is as individual as each water witch. In northern Georgia, Bob Slack has doused successfully for over 17 years. Most dowsers believe they have guardian angels or guides that help them get this information. And I figure that the guys get this message to my subconscious and the subconscious takes over so that uh, the pendulum or the rods react as they do. Bob uses L-shaped rods made of bronze and copper that he believes will turn and twist in his hands in the presence of water. When the rods cross, like so, it, that's a yes answer. And if they don't cross when you ask a question, the answer is no. Right, there's one vein that's flowing off to my right. Right there we are. After locating what he believes is a water source, Bob uses a pendulum to divine how deep the engineer should drill. Is it more than 100 feet? No. 90, 80, 70, 
60. Our sightings crew watched as Bob placed a marker on the spot where his divining rods had indicated water would be found. Then we drilled. I don't believe 100% in them, but I don't disbelieve in them. But Jack Byers became a believer when he hit water, exactly where the water witch said he would. Skeptics argue that if you drill deep enough, you can find water anywhere, with or without dowsing. But drillers here in the Great Western Desert haven't found that to be true. Dry holes mean empty pockets. Water witching is very practical, especially in this country. Um, if you drill a dry hole, you know, you're looking at five to ten thousand plus dollars. I didn't know what a water witch was, uh, and, I, and yet I knew it worked for me. And people would ask me, and i say, I have no idea how it works. I just know that it works. When they drill a well, there, there's water there. In 40 years of dowsing, Eldon Schmutz claims he's only missed three times. A simple willow branch in his hand succeeds where geology maps fail. Even the state of Utah has come to trust his stunning dowsing powers. If I'm holding that stick really tight, it'll go in my hand as it goes down, the bark of the willow against the flesh of my hand. Once Schmutz chooses a drilling site, he uses a coil of baling wire to determine the depth at which water can be found. 286 is the next strata to write down. Got it. I started writing down these depths and it, it really amazed me. He's only a foot or two off. And he tells me before I, uh, I drill. Schmutz believes his is a physical power rather than a psychic gift. Everybody has an aura or an electrical field or a magnetic field about them. And there's no two that are alike, just like there's no two fingerprints that are alike. And those persons who have a strong, strong aura are the one that water witching works for. You hold it as tight as you can, <laughs> you're a water witch. <laughs> I don't know of many well drillers nowadays that don't use a witcher. It's just a natural thing now. I don't even question it anymore. Before I did, now I don't, so. Even us old guys get our education. Eureka, I think we found her. That's good. We're deep enough. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> just like that. <laughs> The American Society of Dowsers has 3,500 members in all 50 states. The roster of clients includes some of the biggest names in drilling and construction, including many large oil companies. But when we queried these companies about their use of dowsing, they refused to comment publicly. If you've had a paranormal experience, call the Sightings Hotline at 1-900-933-SIGHT. That's 1-900-933-7444. Each call 65 cents a minute. Average call lasts three minutes. Sightings is also online. Our email address is sightings at aol.com. Until next time, remember, no mystery is closed to an open mind. For Sightings, I'm Tim White. Sinise what did you people do? and Laura San Giacomo. We are dead. And this is hell. Stephen King's The Stand concludes tonight at 9 Eastern and Pacific on Sci Fi.